Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. You know, when you get to talk to somebody who witnessed film history, you just shut up and listen. And if you're within the sound of my voice, that must mean you are in the seats with once more. As always, my name is Dave Voigt, and I'm the host of this podcast, where we sit down with a wide-ranging variety of industry professionals, and we pick their brain about current projects, state of the industry, how they got started, and so very much more in a light and conversational fashion. And if you like how we do things around here, I'm going to assume that you do, because you're listening right now, uh, you can subscribe to the podcast. You can find us over at Apple, Amazon, Spotify, Google, basically wherever you get your podcasts. Give us the old five-star rating and give us a subscribe and a like. And also, we archive every single one of our episodes over at our In The Seats YouTube channel, so if you can give us a like and subscribe there as well, we'd really appreciate it. Also, uh, don't hesitate to follow us on social media. We are on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at either at In The Seats or at It's Podcast One for all sorts of fun updates. And finally, and I say this a lot, but it is the most important, please pay us a visit over at In The Seats, intheseats.ca, for all the latest and greatest from the world of film, television, the moving image at large, really, because if we love to write about it, and if we love to watch it and write about it and talk about it, we love it when you come by and read about it and listen about it. So please pay us a visit. On this episode, we got a good one. We are talking to a... Hollywood legend, a man who studied with John Cassavetes at the American Academy of Dramatic Arts and had tons of Broadway and off-Broadway roles and even had a hit song that landed him on uh, the Dick Clark Show back in the day. We are talking to Mr. John or Johnny Martino, who uh, who got to, who auditioned for uh, The Godfather. It was his big break and he got it. He played Polly Gatto in the film. And we talk about just sort of his experiences building up uh, to get in the part and working on set and working with Brando and so very much more. It was a delight to talk to the man uh, and uh, a delight rem- to remind us what a damn good film The Godfather is. It is celebrating its 50th anniversary. Go check it out on 4K UHD or regular Blu-ray right now because it's never looked better. But first off, enjoy our talk with Johnny about the legacy of The Godfather, because between you and me, it's a pretty good one. Johnny, thank you so much for the time today, man. I appreciate this. My pleasure. Now, I mean, I'd love to hear the story of how you sort of auditioned and read for the role and got to be a part of this iconic film. Okay, so what happened was in 1969, New Year's Eve, I got invited to Al Martino's house, who played Johnny Fontaine, and Al Ruddy was there. This was like kind of an inside meeting type of thing, and some doctor set it up for me to go. He said, you know, John, you want to get in this movie, you got to meet this producer, his name is Al Ruddy. I said, all right, I'd be happy to go. So I go, James Kahn was there doing the same thing I was doing, you know, smoothing, trying to make friends with everyone. So I already checking me out. I looked at him. We shook hands. He says, you know, John, you got a nice look for the movie. I said, really? I says, yeah, we'll keep in touch. He tells me. Meanwhile, he's busy shaking hands with everyone. So a year later, March 1971, I called a Paramount studio. I don't know, just, just that random hunch. And I says, I'll ready, please. They says, he's in New York filming the movie. Really? They says, yeah. Now, I was going to hang up, Dave. So I turned around. I says, I'm not going to hang up. You got a number on Al Ruddy? He says, yeah. I call him New York. Now, if they're filming, anybody in the world would have hung up. Oh, it's too late. I'm not going to be in the movie. It's too late. But not Johnny Martino. <laughs> I call up and Al Ruddy gets on the phone. He says, uh, Johnny, where are you? I'm in California. He says, give me your number. I'll call you back. Five minutes later, he calls me. He says, Johnny, do you know where Paramount Studios at? And I says, yeah. He's okay. Get in your car. You're going to read for a guy named Bob Evans. He's the president of the studio. And the character's name is Paulie Gatto. Johnny, go right now. It's very important. They're waiting to see you. I said, how far you are? I said, I don't know, 20 minutes, half hour. I got on the freeway, got to Hollywood, got to Paramount Studio on Melrose. So I get there, give me a drive on. I go into the studio park in front of Bob Evans' office. I go in, Fred Roos, the casting director. He comes in the room and he says, Johnny, how are you? I says, good. He says, look, here's a couple of sides. I want you to look at this. He says, the character's poorly, right? And I says, yeah. He says, Clemenza, I'm going to bring in somebody in to read with him. And he brings in Gary Marshall. So Gary comes in. I had met Gary previous because I did a little bit part in a movie with Debbie Reynolds and James Gardner called How Sweet It Is. So I got to meet Debbie and Gardner and all that. So anyway, Gary's sitting next to me. He says, let's do the lines. It's the scene when I'm in the car, when I told 
hey, Rocco, sit on the other side. You blocked the rib, you mirror. <laughs> so she goes, yeah, Sonny's running wild. He's thinking about going to the matches and all that. All right, so Gary said, Johnny, it sounds really good. He says, let's let's go in. Fred came in, knocked on the door. Bob, we're ready. Oh, Johnny, how are you? I said, I'm good. I shake kids with Bob Evans. He said, Johnny, let's do some of the lines. So I did the same line again, read on the, read, read on the back and all that. So anyway, he said, Johnny, you speak Italian. He said, hey, about the my own. And I do. I speak Sicilian fluently. I grew up with Italian parents. All right. He says, we'll get back to you, Johnny. Thanks for coming. I go home, pacing the floor, nervous wreck. I said, ah, we're going to get this thing. Oh, my God. 5.30 in the afternoon, the phone rings. I get on the phone. Hello. Well, this is Johnny Martino. I said, speaking. I said, Johnny, congratulations. You go to New York. You got the part of Paul Ligato. She says, you're going to be working three weeks at that time, this is 1971. So we're going to give you, they're going to start you with $750 a week. So, all right, I go to New York and I get to meet out Ruddy in person. Now we're talking. He says, you know, Johnny, I don't know what made you call, but you called at the perfect time. We had a dozen people audition for this role. So Jerry Orbach was one. Bobby De Niro was another. And the seven other people, I believe in Travolta even had tried. Not Travolta, I'm sorry. Stallone. So now... He said, you know, John, it's a good thing you call because you got, I'm like, look, I, I, from what Bob thought you was amazing, you spoke Italian, so we're so excited that we got you. And I said, listen, I want to thank you for giving me this opportunity. So anyway, I started filming and Francis took a liking to me right off the bat when I did the scene in the car. That same day, they were going to take me for my dead scene. They, they don't do it in exact sequences with the right, right, page. Right. Page. They do what's ever set up for the next shot or whatever. But anyway, before I was finished with the scene, Francis gets in the car and he says, Johnny, you're not a driver stick. He says, Al Pacino did not a drive. And he tried. He broke his ankle almost getting in the car. We had to stop him from driving. He says, but you know, I said, yeah, I could drive a stick. I backed up. He's not driver on the block. He said to me, you know, John, I know, you know, a lot of people. He said, you know, I never met any more people. Now, if there's anything you could do to help me, with the movie, with people or connections or whatever, John, I really would appreciate it. You have anything you want to change, let me know. That might help the movie. I says, of course, I'll help you out as much as I can. And sure enough, he gave me the liberty to do things and make ad lib certain scenes, like when I'm thinking about the wedding purse. Right. 20 grand, small bills, cash, that little silk purse, mud on. If this was somebody else's wedding, sweet tonado. Now, who's going to make up a word? <laughs> Like Sweet Tonado. People ask me, what's Maron? I said, well, Maron is God. Sweet Tonado means how unfortunate that it was somebody, if it was somebody else's wedding, because I would have stole the wedding first. Paulie was a money guy. See, Paulie was easy, easy to be conned yeah. doing something for Salazzo. On a fo- now, if you read the book, Paulie got set up with Salazzo for the money to stay home and play sick. Now, I don't know what the deal was. If he's telling me stay home, I give you some money to stay home. I don't know they're going to shoot Brando. I wasn't in the meeting when, when they're having problems. I wasn't there. But that was not that was not my intention to stay home. But somehow it happened. They set him up. Paulie was the bad guy. And I had to pay with it for my, with my life. <laughs> for sure. Yeah. So anyway, uh, that, that's part of me getting into the film, how I how lucky I am that I'm still here and how I enjoyed working with a great cast of people. And when we see each other, it's truly amazing, the love and respect, no matter how big a role or how small, we all had a certain admiration for each other being in one of the greatest films of all time. Well, and I mean, I love that perspective too, because I mean, obviously at the time, I mean, with all the changes and, you know, people wanted Bob Redford and all that kind of stuff. Like, I never like it, it's really interesting to sort of hear how it was like sort of the industry perspective from the actor's side to, see, right. to, to understand what a big deal this film was, because really, like as much as it is one of the greatest films of all time, like even before it was made, people like, for, for actors, everyone wanted to be a part of it. Exactly. You know, I've met people, even big, famous people. They said, Johnny, you did the big one. Robert Forrester said that to me. It was at Universal doing The Dawn is Dead. There was one mob movie after another. But anyway, yeah, they said, John, you're in a great movie. I, I didn't think of it at that time how great it would be or how great it would become. But as time went on and it 
grew more powerful each time. And I've watched it many times. And I'd watch those scenes and everybody was just so different. Every character was so, every role was so unique. And we all pulled it off together. It worked out amazing. Pacino was incredible, but a nice person. Al's a great guy. Robert Duval. We all just got along so well. We didn't think of who got a bigger role. We never thought that at all when we did the film. Just that we had a lot of fun doing it. No one had an idea what was going on. Is this going to be a big movie or not? Al Ruddy, I became friends with him. He used to take me to the dailies every day to go see what's going on, what we shot yesterday. We'll look at it today. And then James Caan and Pacino, this Charlie, how does it look? As well. I don't know. It's a rough cut. It looks a little dark. I says, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> they were getting worried. So gonna be, I, I guess this would be fine, but I, I don't know. Because when I was to go see the dailies, me, Francis, Al Ruddy would be sitting there and they'd be discussing certain things. Of course, Francis was a little bit nervous. I can understand he's a young guy doing a very, yeah. very powerful script. And of course, the book, so famous and everything. So it was hard for Francis, but you know what? It started working little by little. Each day was getting better and better. And he was really getting into the characters and, and, and you know, cropping the scenes and doing all that other stuff, setting the blocking and all. It was, it was amazing how Francis got it. But he did have the support of people with experience like Marlon Brando, yeah. helping in so many ways. You know, Marlon Brando was friends with Al Ruddy. This is how Brando got into the film. Al Ruddy worked for Marlon Brando at Universal Studio back in the early, late 50s. So when the book came out, he called, Al, Al Ruddy told me the story. He called up Brando and he says, Marlon, did you read this script, this book, The Godfather? He says, no. He said, but do me a favor. Why don't you read it and let me know what you think? Uh, days went by, Brando called him. Yeah, no, I like it. He said, but I want to do a screen test, he tells him. He's all right, we can set that up. He got, a, he got Francis Ford Coppola to go to Brando's house and um, they go. Brando started playing around after he read the book. Got to be an older guy. He's only 48. So while Brando turns around, he started sticking stuff in his mouth. And they're <laughs> laughing. And he's not kidding. He's, listen up. Listen up. And then the makeup guy was there. No, they had to really age him. He, was, sure. he looked like Marlon Brando on the waterfront when I see him yeah. in person. Then he goes to the makeup and everything. He looked amazing. So Marlon Brando got to, got to do the screen test. When Al Ruddy showed it, at the studio, all the big shots looking now. Yeah. But wait a minute, who's this guy? So it's, well, I'll run. He said, take a look, you can see what he says. No, I don't know what it is. Who's this guy? We're gonna use an unknown. We don't want this guy in the movie. He said, no, take a look, it's Marlon Brando. So anyway, Brando winds up with the part and whoa, we're gonna get better than Marlon Brando. Come on, he created such a <laughs> was beautiful. And I got to know him. I worked one day with him looping one day, it was amazing. Anyway. Dave, thank you very much, but it's nice looking. Nice seeing you in person on the phone, on the computer, yeah. Thanks for the time, guys. And don't forget to, to visit our friends over at Bay Street Video for all your DVD, Blu-ray rental, or purchasing needs this summer, as they are still open for curbside and some mailing delivery as well. Over at 1172 Bay Street, Toronto, Ontario, Canada, you can give them a call at 416-964-9088. That's 416-964-9088. Or send them an email at baystreetvideoto at gmail.com for any of your DVD and Blu-ray needs. <laughs>